what's up everybody uh, this is landy aka landmaster of landcaster um, i was asked to do the painting challenge for july um, and i just wanted to start by saying that it has been an absolute pleasure to see everybody's projects come to fruition um, stuff that we all know and love um, done in a different light than we might not have normally expected um, some stuff that I'd never heard of, and I'm sure that many of you had never heard of, um, but it's always a welcome sight to see something new and exciting, um, especially when somebody is painting it and you get to follow along with it, um, as many people have been doing in the painting challenge post. Um, so as far as uh, that, a big thank you to you guys, because without you guys, there wouldn't be a post, there wouldn't be a video, um, <laughs> then this would be pretty boring. You guys would just be hearing me talk for a while. Um, but anywho, let's go ahead and uh, get right to it. Okay, so first up, we have Zach Guevara with a Bandai Saiyan Pod. Um, specifically, this is the one with Vegeta riding inside. Um, Zach did a really good job with the um, sort of weathering and uh, almost like battle damage on um, Vegeta's armor. Um, and did a really good job of kind of taking away from that plasticky toy feeling that sometimes you encounter when you do Bandai or Gunpla kits in general. Um, so really great work on that. Um, definitely would love to see more, and it's kind of inspired me to do some more Gunpla kits, so you guys might be seeing some of those from me in the near future. Okay, and then uh, next up we have uh, Brent Henbury. Um, with his uh, Colossal Squigs, or Giant Squigs, I can't remember which ones they are at the moment, I just know that it's two on one base. Um, it's always great to see anything from the Goblin Army from the old days of uh, Warhammer um, Fantasy, so seeing these guys was definitely a nostalgia, because it's always fun to see these guys painted up um, in crazy different combinations, or even just in the factory, uh, you know, um, box art paint scheme. Um, Brent did a really great job with um, accentuating that squig hide um, color, if you will, um, and then also really doing a good job with making those um, fangs pop out. Um, the thing about squigs is that they're literally teeth with legs, um, so you want to make sure that the teeth are very well accentuated and they don't just look flat or dull. Um, and these squigs definitely look like they're hungry, so great job on that. Um, next up, we have um, Joshua Wayne Horn. Um, he did a hell brute um, for us, and he was actually done pretty quickly, which, uh, you know, kudos, because Lord knows I take forever to paint anything. Um, so it's always great to see somebody finishing the project uh, in relatively short order. Um, the thing that really stood out to me on uh, his hell brute is the, um, the quality or the um, intensity of the purple that he put on the armor. Um, purple is one of those colors that can be a real pain in the butt no matter which brand of paint that you apply. Um, and so it's kind of one of those things where it's similar to yellow and you have to sit there and paint layer after layer after layer to get a really smooth coat that doesn't look blotchy. Um, and whatever he did, it worked because that purple is smooth. Um, and then also he did a sort of different uh, skin tone underneath in, underneath in the uh, Hellbrutes armor um, that you don't usually see on Hellbrutes, but I mean, with that purple skin or with the purple armor, um, it really works well um, to kind of hint that this is a different Hellbrute. Um, not sure which chapter he was going for, if it was going to be Emperor's Children or if it was going to be maybe just something else, um, but that's a really good color scheme, so uh, definitely looking forward to seeing more from him. Next up, we have Patrick O'Dell with uh, Robot Girly Man, <laughs> Robo Gilliman, to be exact. Um, I, confession time here, I have not finished my uh, Gilliman, but it's kind of inspiring to see that so many people got theirs and actually finished them. Um, <laughs> it wasn't just a flash in the pan because it was a cool looking model kind of thing. Um, and in Patrick's case, what I really, really liked about his is that the armor isn't the usual um, sort of bright 
gold that you see um, from GW when it comes to the Smurfs. Uh, I mean, Ultramarines. Um, <laughs> it's a very sort of pale, almost uh, almost a ancient gold, if you will. Um, there's a really great color from Vallejo um, that's called, I believe, Old Gold. Um, very similar to what he did here. Um, I'm not sure which color he chose to make the effect that he did, um, but it turned out really nice, um, and it's really inspiring to see that it's it's still Gilliman, but it's a different take on him. Um, so really, really pleased with how that turned out for him. Um, definitely, if he's going to be doing any other Ultramarines, I uh, would definitely love to see some more of those. Next up on the list, uh, we have Josh Kane with a Plague Angel from Creature Castings. Um, the first thing that jumps out at me when I see this model, so first of all, it has a very frightening sort of uh, gaunt look to it. Um, if anybody remembers the movie Alien Resurrection um, from a few years back, um, it kind of resembles that alien-human hybrid. Um, that Ripley ends up uh, being the mother to, basically. Um, really, really sunken in eyes, and then the really sharp fangs, um, and then that really nasty sort of pallid skin. Um, Josh didn't go with a really pale skin. He went with that really bright green. Um, it might actually be more toned down in real life, but in the photos it comes out kind of bright but it only serves to accentuate those really gaunt features even more. Um, kind of like uh, creating a really bright spot and then leaving the darker shadows in the eye sockets and stuff to give you the impression that this thing is a lot more um, gaunt or you know famished than it actually is, which you know fits the theme of it being a plague uh, sort of demon um, prince. Um, and then great job on the wings, too, and then all the bone pieces and stuff. So um, really creepy. It's going to be in my nightmares uh, for a couple of weeks. So thanks for that, Josh. Next up, we have uh, Yom Pitchetman. I hope I pronounced that right. I apologize if I didn't. Um, with uh, two different um, entries, actually, for this month, uh, he did a scar brand. Um, and he also did a um, demon engine. The name escapes me right now. Um, gosh, what is it called? I always forget the name of that one. The Soul Grinder. That's what it is. I knew it was going to come to me eventually. Um, but his scar brand is just mind-blowingly good. Um, the brass on the armor plates looks really cool, really great. Uh, combination with the red skin um because that's kind of corn's thing that bright red skin with that brass armor um and then he kind of complements that by having some blue in there on his beard and in a couple of other sections that just really sets that that paint scheme apart um and then i believe and it may not be scarbrand i apologize i'm thinking of scarbrand um as the demon prince but Maybe I'm not. If uh, somebody knows exactly, please correct me in the comments below. Um, the the whole uh, way that he's created um, this this sort of really beastly corn warrior that we all know, um, I think, is really really good. Um, and then his soul grinder follows on that same note with that really bright red skin, um, but it's more mechanical, so it doesn't have as much of the brass, um, but it still really evokes that same sort of corn feeling, and it would fit right in the same army. So if it's the same army, I mean, psh, nailed it right there. The next one that we have is Alex Howarth, or Howarth, I'm sorry. Um, he has a... Uh, Warhammer Fantasy Giant um, that he's done some conversion work to um, that just, wow, you know, really blows you away, first of all, because it looks so natural um, as far as, like, it doesn't look like it's a um, anything that was added on 
um, as an afterthought, um, he really planned out this conversion on the giant in terms of like the nose, um, the repositioning of the arms and legs, um, and then changing up the club itself a little bit, and then giving him a keg uh, tucked up under his arm. Um, the skin tone is also spot on, um, and I think that the paint job is what really lends a bit of realism or believability to all of the conversion work that he did. Um, because you can't really tell if you didn't see the beforehand pictures of the work in progress. Um, so, I mean, it is just so awesome. And it kind of makes me want to just go out and buy a uh, Fantasy Giant right now and try my hand at doing some conversion work. Um, but yeah, it, it would pale in comparison with how good this is. Um, you know, my hat's off to you, Alex, because you know what? You love Giants, and... It shows in the quality of work that you do, man. So, great job on that. Another person that we've got that's doing um, two entries uh, for this month is Tom Joseph. Um, he did a pair of Hell Brutes, um, and then he also did a Tau Forge World Supremacy Armor. Um, his Hell Brutes have this really interesting yellow paint scheme that's not the usual sort of Imperial Fist yellow that a lot of people think of. Um, it's very sort of creepy looking, almost like a, like a day glow color, but not quite because it's definitely not a, a neon color in any way. Um, it just kind of has that look to it, and it's largely because the skin tone underneath is a very purplish reddish hue, um, so it just kind of brightens the yellow up because of how dark it is. Um, and then on his Tau um, Forge World armor, um, he went with a red and blue scheme that just so cool looking. I mean, there's no other way to put it, really. Um, great job on the highlights and the edging and stuff like that. Um, I've always been a fan of Tau armor, even though I've only ever painted them once for somebody um, in a very dark blue urban camo scheme um but i love seeing patterns like the ones that he did the ones that um that that tom used because it's um it almost uh sort of evokes images of like gundams and stuff with the way that the color scheme is really sharp and crisp and the colors are bright but not like overpowering um so they're very reminiscent of sort of like the original gundam or maybe even um like Gundam Wing Zero, a um, little bit more white, and it would probably look exactly like him. It'd be a dead ringer. Um, but great job on the OSL as well, because he managed to do the OSL in a couple of different places on the model itself um, that kind of hint at, one, that there's weapons that are charging up, but also that the suit itself seems to glow just from actually being turned on and working. Um, so my hat's off to Tom because OSL for me is one of those things that I struggle with. And so it's always great to see somebody that does an awesome job with stuff like that. Um, please feel free to share your technique for that OSL in the, in the group, man. Um, I'm sure that we would all love to see it and try it um, and learn from you. Next up, we have Eric Reese. Um, he did two as well. Um, the first one that he did, I'm not sure on the company if it's Reaper or Ral Partha, um, but it's a sort of a summoner or warlock or um, something to that effect, and a spirit that he's summoning. Um, and the thing that stands out to me, because the, the summoner is a great clean job as far as like the robes and the skin tone and everything like that um, but the thing that really stands out on this two-figure diorama is the spirit itself because of the colors that he chose um, it's got that very ethereal sort of um, Lord of the Rings feel to it um, I always immediately think of uh, the scene where Aragorn goes to make the deal with the former kings and gets the ghost army um, so it's sort of like that that spectral color scheme that's supposed to kind of look almost see-through. Um, and Eric did a really great job with capturing that with the colors that he chose. Um, I'm 
not sure what he did on his base coat, but I'm pretty sure that he primed it white because to achieve the colors that he did um, in the brightness that he did, um, it would be very difficult to do it under black or over black, I'm sorry. Um, and then the other figure that he did for this was the original Reaper um, Dragons Don't Share diorama. Um, that dragon just turned out so cool, and it's always nice to see older Reaper um, kits uh, done up. Um, I myself have a pile of Reaper kits sitting waiting to get done, um, mostly because I'm uninspired on them, but seeing stuff like this Reaper dragon really kind of gets the creative juices flowing. Um, great job on the scales, um, on the wings, and everything else. Um, I think uh, I think if anybody's got the uh, classic miniatures down right now it's uh it's eric for sure um the next figure that we have or the next submission that we have is from uh my good buddy here kim larson um he submitted a uh, dancer from the dark souls board game um i'll i'll admit first uh before i say anything else that I have not played Dark Souls ever, but seeing all of these figures that Kim and a couple of other people have been working on have really inspired me to, one, pick up the game, or two, get the board game and try my hand at some of these figures because the level of detail that these things have is really awesome. Um, and Kim did a really great job with the dancer model itself because I went ahead and looked up the actual box art or the art from the game itself to see some stills of the figure that it was supposed to be um, and it's sort of like in a pit glowing with fire and stuff and then it's got the cloak that's sort of shimmering and see-through almost so that kind of begs the question well how do you recreate that with a tabletop figure um, and Kim did a really great job with the cloak, for one, by using a couple of different blues and grays and giving it a swirling color scheme to kind of indicate that it's moving and that it's a little bit fluid, um, which, comparing it to the artwork, I mean, I believe that that's exactly what that was supposed to represent. Um, and then he did some OSL underneath after he applied the armor color. Um, he went back with some yellow and stuff to kind of give you that effect of the glowing underneath it. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kim, but I think this thing is supposed to be much bigger than a person. So you would be looking at it from underneath in the game and you would see all this glowing, you know, um, armor and stuff. So I think he did a really great job in capturing that, that feel of the game. Um, so much so that now, I mean, more than anything, I just want to paint one of these things, even if I don't ever get to play the game. <laughs> so, great job with that, man. Um, next up, we have uh, Adam Taylor with uh, his uh, Hordes Legion of Everblight Angelius. I believe it's the Angelius. Um, this gargantuan um, really is gargantuan. Um, I think it's probably the tallest one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know that I have the Trollblitz Glacier King, and it's pretty big um, as in terms of wide, um, but I don't think it's as tall as the uh, Angelius is. Um, but the really nice thing that stood out to me with his uh, with his Gargantuan is the one the, the skin tone. Um, with that purple color is so um, gorgeous. I love purple skin tones when they're done right. Um, and Adam Taylor definitely knocked it out of the park with this one. Um, the box art color scheme for the Angelius is um, a very pale gray. Um, I believe somebody else was doing a couple of different boards miniatures, but they didn't get to finish in time. Um, but they were doing that standard paint scheme. Um, but this really nice, vivid purple scheme works really well with them as well um, and Adam did a great job with the wings as well they have that very leathery texture to them um, and he picked it out really well with the uh, highlight that he chose for it um, and then all the different bone chitin plates look really nice with the uh, 
the bone colors and khakis and stuff that he chose. Um, one of my favorite things, and I see this on, on this one, um, to do with Chitin is to take and do real thin line highlights at the very edge of it to give that impression of texture when you don't actually have any. Um, so great job with that too, man. Next up, we have uh, Joseph Boudreau with uh, Azag the Slaughterer, um, another older um, Warhammer Fantasy uh, model from the days of before Age of Sigmar. Um, the really nice thing about Azag is his mount. Um, it has so many little details on it uh, that Joseph managed to find all of them. I know I missed a few when I painted one some time back. Um, but he did a phenomenal job picking out all the details on it, um, giving it that sort of reptilian texture to the skin and everything. Um, did a great job capturing that, and then keeping the orc's armor relatively simple, not going too overboard with colors and stuff like that, just kind of keeping it that dirty, oily steel. Um, and then his banner, um, being in that blue color scheme, really works with the darkness of the dragon. Actually, I don't think it's a dragon. I think it's a wyvern, technically. Um, but now I'm just being a nerd nitpicking things. Um, but it really works with that dark skin tone because of how bright it is. Uh, so there's all kinds of things all over this mini that you can just turn and find something. Turn and find something. There's, there's never a dull moment when you're spinning this model around. Um, and Joseph did a really great job capturing that. So, cool. Cool beans, man. You did a great job with that one. Next up, we have Steve Flershinger um, with his Reaper Bones um, Frog Hemoth, I believe was the name of the model. I may be wrong. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is how gross this thing is, how ugly it is. And I mean that as a very sincere compliment because this thing is so nasty looking. Uh, because he captured all the detail that, that the Bones miniature has. Um, a lot of people sometimes complain about Bones miniatures not having a whole lot of detail, or sometimes that they're kind of soft on their features, um, but that definitely wasn't the case with this one. Um, and Steve really captured all the uh, nasty, gritty details in terms of like the mouth on the frog, um, and then the, uh, the teeth and everything. And then he went and took it an extra step further, and added some sort of green ooze coming out of its mouth and dribbling down its chin down to the floor below um, that really just completes the look and it just makes you want to ensure that you guys have a really strong party to kill this thing or run away from it really really fast i'm thinking it's run away really really fast because otherwise you're going to end up inside this thing <laughs> Next entry that we have is uh, another twofer um, by Jamie McKendry. Um, he did two different ones. He did a Death Company Dreadnought and a Death Company Storm Raven. Um, I know that uh, when I was following along with the work in progress, Jamie was having some trouble with the lightning claws on the Dreadnought. Um, but, dude, seriously, don't worry about it because it turned out awesome. You got the glow right. You got the lightning kind of arcing off of it um, on the tips of the claws and stuff. It turned out spot on. So um, job well done on that. That If that's what you were setting out to do, you nailed it in my opinion. Um, so you, your, your armor and everything else was really clean, but I know that the focus that you were really focused on was the the claws and uh, you knocked it out of the park. Good job with those. And then on the Storm Raven, um, what I really liked uh, about this one in particular um, is that even though it was the Death Company and it was the, you know, the standard Death Company scheme, um, you went that extra mile and added some detail or line highlights to the markings for the Death Company to kind of stand out that red a little bit more and make it pop with that orange highlight on the edge. Um, a lot of people forget to do that, and they kind of just do the red X, or they do the red on some of these vehicles and just leave it as is. Um, but 
adding that extra orange or really light red that you added makes it pop and makes it look like it's engraved. Um, so great job with that stuff, man. I would be making sure that that thing dies with Laz Cannon Fire because I'm pretty sure that Death Company Dreadnought is hanging off the backside um, with a whole bunch of angry Marines inside waiting to just rip me to shreds. So uh, good job with that one. The next entry that we have after that is by Robert Jones, um, who did a Forge World Scaby Thrax. Um, this is one of my favorite Forge World models um, from way back in the day, um, and it has stood the test of time, so much so that other companies have tried to duplicate it, um, but really there's no, there's no denying the original's awesome quality. Um, and Robert did a really good job with capturing it. Um, I only chose the one photo from the front because some of the other photos of the back and stuff. Um, I know on Forge World's website they used to have them blurred out, so um, for the sake of keeping it family friendly, I just decided to go with the front one. Um, but I really liked how gooey and drippy and nasty looking everything was on this model. Um, and really, that's what Nurgle's all about making something look as gross as you can. Um, and Robert did a really great job with that, so uh, kudos to you, man. The next entry after that is by Josh Schaub. Um, it's the Reaper Bones Tree Spirit, or Forest Elemental. I'm not sure what they call this one, um, but it's a, it's a favorite of mine, and it's another older Reaper model that has gotten a new lease on life. Um, ever since the Reaper Bones line came out. Um, it's chock full of detail. This is one of those models that really inspires you um, to kind of either start a Wood Elf army or use it in some sort of campaign as an NPC or something to that effect because it's just such a characterful piece. Um, it's got such a great face. And then there's all these different toadstools um, and then the vine growth, and then the way that the bushels and stuff are just kind of making themselves um, look like clothing, but it's actually just the leaves and other stuff growing on him. Um, and to be honest with you, I forgot about this model. Um, I wanted one of these sometime back to add to my um, Wood Elf army, and I could never remember the name of it, and, and to this day I still can't, but it's a really great figure that fits in so many different games, um, and especially with the Bones miniatures being as expen inexpensive as they are, um, it's kind of like one of those ones that you just have to pick up if you see it in the store because of how cool it is. Um, and like I said, I think the thing that really stands out to me with Josh's version of it um, is how well he picked out all the details and how tied together everything is on this model. Um, the colors are great. Um, and then the toadstools and all the other little bits and pieces that are on him um, stick out in such a way that they draw your attention to them, but they're not they're not wrong. They just belong there because it's a part of nature. And, it, and then the other thing that really stands out at me is the way that he incorporated the base um, and all of the growth and everything on the base into the rest of the color scheme for the model. Um, the, the the thing that I, I love seeing is when somebody can take a model that most people might overlook um, and doing something so completely different with it um, that it just makes you go, wow. And, and that's what this one does. Um, it really does capture your attention from the ground up, literally, because it looks like this tree just woke up from a thousand year slumber and he's coming to see what's going on. Um, because somebody's probably messing with some woodland creatures and he's about to stomp them. So <laughs> I think you did an awesome job with that one, Josh. Um, our next entry um, is by John Rolson, and it's a Korgorath. And the thing that, that was so different and so unique about this one um, was the fact that John decided to go with more of a normal, if you could call it normal, um, skin tone for it. Um, that makes it look more like a mutated 
barbarian who's become a Korgorath rather than the usual Korgorath with the blood red skin. His looks more like a, you know, blood weaver who's been gifted a boon from chaos by Korn and become mutated and changed into this thing. Um, he did such a great job with the flesh tone um, that it doesn't look wrong or it doesn't look out of place with it. Um, and then all the other details that he picked out on it look really good too. Um, I know sometimes people are like, great, another Korgorath, but no, this one is different from all the others because of that skin tone. And that skin tone is what really sells it. Um, so I would definitely love to see this thing coming at me on the other side of the tabletop, if nothing else, just to get shredded to pieces by it. So our next entry is going to be by Trent Miles, and it's another model from Dark Souls. Um, I'm not sure which one it is, but I believe it's a ghoul of some sort. Again, I'm not too familiar with the game, um, but I think that uh, Trent did a really great job with doing some necrotic skin that seems like it's almost uh, pale and zombie-like falling off, um, and then just did a really great, simple, clean job on the axe that he's carrying around. Um, so it almost reminds me of like a uh, Scooby-Doo villain um, with that sort of like nasty-looking skin that you're afraid to know what's underneath, um, but. Again, these, these Dark Souls models are really standing out at me as something that I need to probably look into getting. Um, between everything that Trent has done and everything that Kim has done, I'm definitely considering it. And you guys are just uh, feeding the addiction. You know, great job. <laughs> Next up, we have a bit of a departure from the usual. Um, it's by Mark Dewhurst. It's a Tamiya 135th scale. Um, British SAS Jeep, uh, specifically in the Pink Panther color scheme. Um, I started doing some research on this, and um, Mark can correct me on it if I mess up, um, but during World War II, um, the uh, Desert Reconnaissance Group um, found out that pink as a color in the desert worked really well as camouflage, um, so they started painting all their jeeps pink um, to kind of camouflage them in the desert um, against uh, the Germans. Um, and Mark has two kits that he originally posted in his work in progress. One that actually was the Pink Panther, and then one that was just a regular SAS jeep. But he combined the two kits, I believe, and then made the one Pink Panther and painted the color scheme to that to that level, um, <laughs> and most people go, "What a pink jeep!" But it works. I mean, it looks really good. Um, did a great job with the weathering, and then adding all the stowage kits. And then the other thing that really stands out at you is the fact that the guys are wearing their civvy clothes, the Hawaiian shirts and stuff like that. So it's like a group of guys that must have just gotten called back from their leave. Uh, to go on some crazy mission, and they just decided to go with what they were wearing. So um, it's a really good piece um, that's not your usual game uh, stuff, so it's always cool to see some scale model. I know, me personally, I love scale modeling, um, and I don't really post a whole lot of that stuff here because I, I love seeing everybody's work as far as the games and stuff like that, but I do love seeing a really good, really well done scale model um, from time to time. So if anybody has any scale models or anything like that that they're thinking about doing or thinking about posting, um, don't be shy. Feel free to post them because that stuff is really cool. Um, our next entry after that is the uh, Imperial Knight Titan by William Coleman. Um, I'm not sure which house this is supposed to be, but I do love the, the color scheme in the uh, the sort of almost OD green, olive drab green, and that yellow ochre color. Um, I believe he didn't post his finished picture or um, his weathered picture, but the model itself was completed. 
um, to a finished level minus its weathering and basing and stuff like that. Uh, so judging from that alone, um, I really love how clean the armor plates look. Um, I'm sure that there must have been some some difficulties with that because of the yellow and green, um, but more power to you, man, because that's a really cool color scheme that you got going on there, and I think uh, when everything's all said and done, when everything's weathered and stuff, we'd love to see it because I can only imagine how beat up this thing is going to end up if you were going to beat it up. I mean, if it's going to be like fresh off the assembly line, ready to go to battle, then hey, you're already done. You just need to slap a base on it. Um, but I, I love seeing Titans. Um, I've never painted one. I've always wanted to. Um, but it's always really inspiring to see people painting up Titans and stuff, um, you know, with these really awesome schemes and stuff like that. Um, getting the gears and all the internal workings to look right and then putting these nice, crisp, clean armor plates on top. Um, and then uh, he can correct me on this, I believe, but I think William also went ahead and did an extra step and magnetized all of the weapons for it, um, which if I had one, I would definitely be doing that just because of how easy it is to do them with a larger model like that. Um, but yeah, uh, really great job with that, William. Looking forward to seeing more from you, man. Um, our next entry, and we're wrapping it up here in a little bit, and then I'll be giving you guys the announcement for the winner. Um, the next entry we have is another scale model. So we had two scale models this year, or this month, rather. Um, great job with scale models. Um, Pierce Brand, um, I believe it's a T60, although it may be a T72. I'm sure somebody's going to yell at me and tell me why I'm wrong um, and why I didn't pick up on something. But hey, <laughs> you know, that's why we do this so that we can learn a little bit more because it's a fun way to get a history lesson at the same time that you're building something. Um, Anyway, Pierce's T-60 or T-72 Russian T-Tank um, looks like it came out of the latest edition of Weathering Magazine from AK Interactive. Um, he did a really great job, and I'm not sure if he used acrylics um, or enamels, but the overall armor paint scheme just looks really good um, with that sort of, uh, not OSL, but sort of like a... Uh, um, forced highlights on the plates and stuff to kind of give you that impression of the uh, of the armor being a lot um, more uh, shapely than it actually is um, and then everything on it from the tracks to the the actual hull and everything looks so good uh, and like I was saying previously about somebody else's um, tank um, I see all these different scale models and it's giving me the bug to go back and do some more scale models and submit that stuff um, just to see if I can do anything remotely as good as some of the stuff that gets posted. Um, but it's, it's, it's fun because it's such a challenge to see something and go, I want to do that, and then to go out and try it. Um, and Pierce's T60 is just one of those models that makes you go, wow. Like... I want to use that exact paint scheme for my T60s or for my T72s in Team Yankee. Um, I'm definitely going to be doing that because I've got some, t uh, some T72s that I'm working on for somebody right now. Um, they're definitely going to get painted in a very similar scheme like that. So, um, Pierce, if you have any tips on the best way to do that, the best way to do like the washes and the stuff for that, um, definitely feel free to shoot me a message or leave me a comment explaining what you did because... That's a pretty killer paint job that you did there, man. And last but not least, um, we have Justin Beavers, um, Adeptus Mechanicus, um, Onager Dune Crawler um, for his son's army. Uh, the paint scheme, I guess, was already predetermined because of the army's paint scheme um, with that red and uh, sort of bleach bone color on the plates. Uh, but the thing that stood out to me, and I'm sure it stood out to him as well, was the yellow that was chosen for the different uh, sort of glowing OSL parts on these guys, because it almost, uh, with with most of the Adeptus Mechanica stuff, and I'm not sure how true this is with the Onager Doomcrawler, um, they use a lot of radiation in their weaponry, um, 
so that yellow color kind of goes well with that because it's not the typical blue OSL or the green OSL. So it's kind of like more of a, I would almost say toxic uh, OSL. So it definitely means that there's something else uh, powering those weapons and powering um, the the Doom Crawler itself. Um, I never realized this until I studied this model closely. It has so much detail um, on it, not just in the legs and in the weapon, but like in the missile pod on the side. Um, I've only ever seen these things with that hatch closed. Um, so the fact that he went the extra mile to leave that thing open um, and then do all of the different missiles in the pod individually um, just really goes to show that sometimes it's worth it to take that extra step um, to do something that maybe maybe you will just close that hatch, um, but it always pays to do that extra step because you'll know it's there. And then if you really want to, you can take a photo of it and then just have that photo accompany the model and say, yeah, it actually has this, and then you can kind of show people that. Um, but in the case of Justin's, he left that hatch open, kind of like it's about to launch a salvo of missiles and fire off its, uh, its cannons. So really great job with that, Justin. I'm sure that your son's going to be happy with that. Now I just need to try to convince my daughter uh, that she needs to start playing Warhammer. <laughs> right. Okay, so now it's time to announce the uh, model that I've decided is going to go um, up as the um, page's cover photo for the next month until the next challenge. Um, and... First of all, again, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that submitted something for this challenge. Um, it was probably the most uh, submissions that we've had in any one particular month. Um, and it was also the first time that I've seen so many people be so inspired to complete multiple projects for um, the monthly challenge. I know I was trying to do more than one, but unfortunately I wasn't able to. Um, but you know, more power to the guys that were so inspired to complete stuff because that's what it's all about. It's about painting all the minis, guys. Everything. Everything needs paint on it because we don't want to play with green minis. Um, and besides, painted minis usually roll better. Um, it's proven fact. It's science. It's not fake news, I swear. Um, but anywho, moving on to the announcement, and we have a drum roll. Um, the winner for this month um it was such a tough choice um there's so many great entries you guys um but i think the one that stands out to me the most as far as um, the quality of the paint job the incorporation of the base into it um and the overall um feeling that the uh, the model inspires um as far as its presence um I have to give it up to Josh Schaub and his um, Tree Spirit or Forest Elemental. Um, I'm sure we'll get the name right eventually. Um, that model just really gave me the, the warm and fuzzies um, and made me remember um, the feeling I got when I first fielded my Wood Elf Army um, about 15 years ago. Um, I think this model, um, Josh really did a great job capturing what the model was supposed to be. Uh, and he gave it a new lease on life, and he was also able to incorporate all of the different elements that go into making a model or making a mini a complete piece of art. Um, and so, you know, with that, I just have to give you a round of applause, man. Um, keep up the awesome work. Um, don't, you know, don't stop. Don't stop believing. Um, no, don't stop. Uh, you know, don't stop posting stuff. Um, show us what you got because that that's what it's all about um so i'm sure everybody else will congratulate you man you did an awesome job and keep up the good work and with that that is a wrap for this month's painting challenge video i'm sure that i have rambled on a lot longer than anybody wanted to listen to me um but you know if you guys liked it give it a thumbs up and that is it for now. We will be back with next month's challenge.